Hello again, everybody. Jim Hessler, co-host of the Battle of Gettysburg podcast, coming to you once again on our YouTube channel here on the Battle of Gettysburg podcast. Now, every once in a while on YouTube, I interrupt normal Gettysburg programming to sometimes veer off onto other topics of interest. And today I'm really excited to tackle one of my favorite topics, which is the Battle of the Alamo. Now, I'm going to be joined by a friend of ours and a, a senior researcher and historian at the Alamo. His name is Colby Lanham. Colby, we met Colby a couple of years ago when we were taking a tour of the Alamo. And ever since then, Colby, Thomas, Ernesto, the whole team at the Alamo has always been super supportive of us, very gracious whenever we've come down here. So I'm really excited for the opportunity to get Colby onto the Battle of Gettysburg podcast and talk about what's going on at the Alamo. So I don't want to steal any more of Colby's thunder. Hope you'll stay tuned here on the Battle of Gettysburg podcast as we remember the Alamo with our good friend, Colby Lanham. Colby Lanham, welcome to the Battle of Gettysburg podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Well, I really uh, owe you a favor. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to come talk to us about another one of my favorite history topics, the Battle of the Alamo. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I'm a big fan of what you guys do over there, and uh, I always enjoy seeing you guys when you come to town, so it's my pleasure to help out. Well, you and I have known each other for a couple of years. We're not good, great friends, but we could be. You yeah. could come to Gettysburg more. We could, <laughs> I could hang out at the Alamo more. But for my uh, audience who is interested in the Civil War and presumably tuning into this conversation for, the, uh, for their interest in the Alamo, tell them us a little bit about yourself. How'd you get yeah, involved sure. with the Alamo? Yeah, yeah. So I kind of just, uh, I landed here kind of by accident, really. I was working on my undergrad after leaving the military. I was in the Air Force for six years. And um, I was working on my undergrad in anthropology, and I was hoping to go into battlefield, uh, uh, forensic, or, uh, sorry, forensic anthropology and focus on battlefield stuff. I kind of worked with the military, um, rep repatriating remains and finding crash sites uh, from like the Second World War. I kind of wanted to do that. And um, I ended up landing here in San Antonio. I'm from Texas to begin with. And uh, I applied for a job and they hired me. And I've been here ever since. And it turned out to be the right route for me. Did you have, as a child or growing up or anything, did you have any general interest in the Alamo? I'll tell you the truth. Um, I did not have Texas history because I was a military brat. So okay. I bounced around um, and lived in Germany for 10 years. And so uh, when I came back, I was for my junior year of high school, and I'll be really honest, I didn't know the Alamo uh, was a loss for Texas. I didn't know much about it at all. I was kind of like your average visitor today when they show up to the Alamo. And um, over the past 11 years, I've really immersed myself in the topic. And um, I, I think it was good to start with a, fr a fresh, clean slate uh, whenever you're looking at this topic. Well, tell us what your title is at the Alamo and what specifically your role is. What do you do? Yeah, I'm the senior researcher and historian for the Alamo. Um, I, I head the, the research department, which is myself and one other researcher named Thomas Ledesma. Who I know Thomas. Met. Tell him I yeah. said hi. Yeah, he's fantastic. He's a huge uh, fan of your podcast. He loves this. So um, so he and I, uh, we take in all of the big research questions that get posed to the Alamo, um, both by the general public, but also internal requests to, to help shape um, teaching the education department and public facing programs. And then we also sit, uh, I sit on a historian's uh, panel that's working on the content for the new Visitor Center Museum, which we've been shaping that content for, I think, over five years now. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I know. And we'll come to some of the current developments and things you guys are working on at the end. Uh, I know that the first time we met you and first time we met Thomas, friends and family, we were taking some site tours through the Alamo and both of you gave us some interpretive programs related to the uh, the Alamo itself. You talked to us about the 18 pounder. Thomas has talked to us about different stuff, but whether it's dealing with the public or maybe research requests that you receive, what are some of the most commonly uh, held myths and misconceptions that maybe people still have either about the Alamo or the Texas revolution? Yeah, um, man, we we get a lot of um, we get a lot of crazy questions, of course. And I think I may have told you before uh, that we get everything from where's the big bell with a crack in it to where did Thomas Jefferson die? We get this huge 
a wide array of questions. And because the Alamo's history is big and broad, it's over 300 years, not including the pre-contact period of the indigenous people for 10,000 years. We have a lot of information to cover and it's very tricky for people. So um, one of the things that people say right off the bat is, uh, why is it so small? Uh, they thought the Alamo would be huge. And, and what they don't realize is that we only have two of the original structures out of a four and a half acre compound. It was very large at one time, but due to urban sprawl, we've lost most of it. The other one, we get a lot of questions about where, how, you know, where's the basement at? You know, from Pee Wee's mm -hmm. big, uh, big, big adventure, we get that a lot. Um, and I, you know, now with the ongoing projects that we have, we're getting less and less of that and more uh, kind of more serious questions about okay, what's good. happening to the plaza and the transformation that uh, the Alamo is going through. Um, and so that's that's a positive thing, in my opinion. We still welcome all questions, but it's neat to see it trending in a different direction. Yeah, you know, that's cool. Yeah, you know, we do we deal with many of the same things here at Gettysburg doing interpretation. Some people come in with a lot of knowledge. Some people come in with really off the wall questions, but hopefully you can turn even those off the wall questions around into some knowledge and hopefully build some interest or around what really happened at the site. I grew up watching the John Wayne movie. Tell me where you're going to tell <laughs> me that movie is 110% accurate, right? Or, you, you know, um, here's the deal. Uh, we owe John Wayne a huge debt of gratitude for yeah. that movie. You know, being that it's not historically accurate is fine by me. We shouldn't be consuming our history through Hollywood anyway. You know, this yeah. is entertainment and what he did, um, whether you like his acting style or not, um, he fostered and cultivated an entire generation of love for the Alamo, as did Fess Parker, mm -hmm. uh, who played David Crockett and Daniel Boone, both uh, for, in the Disney shows. And then even the two th 2004 film. I mean, these are the things that we need to continue uh, generations to fall in love with our story. And I don't know if you've noticed, but we don't have a John Wayne or a Fess Parker currently. So we're kind of in an, we have an issue here that this younger generation, uh, we we're starting to uh, lose the story a little bit. Yeah, and it's not good. So that's why these projects that we're going to talk about later are so important. Well, you could be a candidate for that. You've already got a big hat going. We <laughs> could just sort of change the style of that. Yeah, yeah. Again, we have the same situation in the Civil War. Glory, the movie Gettysburg, those movies yeah. are well over 30 years old now. And although both of them still have devoted followings, it's the same situation. We 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 need a way to attract, attract new people. And I, again, I think that's just common yeah. to American history in general, but certainly our topics. That's it. That's it. We're fighting iPads and cell phones. I mean, that's yeah. a, that's a tough candidate uh, to, or a tough opponent to go up against. But I, I hope that both sides, Gettysburg and the Alamo both, will be able to move forward in a really positive way. And I, I really do think that the stuff that's ongoing on our site, which, again, we're going to talk about later, I think that's big and it's going to change a lot. Of yeah. Things for Okay, well, so then we've kind of dissed on the movie a little bit, wink, wink. Um, <laughs> let's do a little real history here. Causes of the Texas Revolution. Sometimes it can feel like it's sort of a very dry conversation about constitutions and, and things of that nature. Whereas, again, I'll go to the other extreme. John Wayne kind of told us it was all about freedom and republics and, oh, and yeah. things like that. Uh, how do you educate people? What What's the real in a nutshell, cause of the Texas Revolution. Yeah, I would say, you know, yeah, that one extreme to the other you just mentioned, and both of those are parts, uh, part true, right? Some people are fighting for patriot patriotism and freedom, and others are, you know, fighting about the Constitution of 1824. I would, you know, I would say that the major driver here that people need to really take away from this story is that it is centralism versus federalism. The Federalist Constitution of 1824 and the centralist government under Santana centralized under him in Mexico City is what causes the revolutions to break out. And that's a big thing we teach at the Alamo currently is the Alamo is not a standalone revolution on its own two feet. It is part of a very large Mexican revolution that's taking place in the lower part of Mexico and moving northward and Texas is pulled into it. Okay. And you know, we only talk about Texas today because Texas is the only Mexican state that is part of that revolution that is successful in its revolution. Um, the Yucatan is its own story and, and, and uh, is very interesting in its own right, but um, Texas wins independence. Now, had it went differently, you'd be looking at kind of more of a European situation down in Mexico with several countries and then the United States. But uh, Texas is successful in its revolution, and it really boiled down to centralism versus federalism. Okay. 
is the idea that many people have of Santa Ana is a dictator cracking down on freedom and that sort of thing. Is that a fair, accurate assessment or is the real story maybe more nuanced than that? Yeah, there's a little bit to it, a little bit more to it than that. And what people need to realize about Santa Ana is that he is not Mexican. Right. So they think that this this Mexican uh, gentleman or Santa Ana is coming to power and he's dictating these things on onto the Mexican people. What's actually happening is that he is Spanish. He's Spanish born. He serves in the Spanish Royal Army. He uh, serves in a very tumultuous time in, in Mexican history. And he sees how Spain deals with revolutionaries with a very heavy hand and uh, and, and a very, very uh, powerful army. And they crush them. And so he uses the same policies from that period to, um, you know, basically force his idea and agenda on the Mexican people during his own time. And um, the other side of that, I would say, is that people don't realize there is kind of a puppet master. You know, Santana might be a, pup, a little bit of a puppet here. The puppet master is actually going to be Tornell. And Tornell's okay. decrees that he writes out or what Santa Ana uses as guidelines to fight the text revolution. One of the things the Tornell decrees is that the Texans are not uh, an army. They're not recognizing them as a nation. And they're actually, um, they label them as pirates. And yeah. so pirates are put down uh, in a very brutal way. And so Santana, you know, he could actually claim a little bit that he's following orders. Yeah, you know, that pirates concept kind of leads into where I was going to go with the next question. We've met Santana. How about the Texas defenders? What are they... I'm sure there's a mix of motivations. How do you explain to people when they may say, hey, what are these guys doing in quote unquote Mexican territory in the first place? How do you talk yeah. to them? Yeah, no, that's a good question. So, you know, there's very few, as you know, uh, very few um, conflicts in human history that are uh, pushed by a single cause, right? So this one's multi-causal, um, many, like many other conflicts. And the people who are involved, they're from all over the place. They're from all over the United States. They're from Europe. Some of them are native born Mexicans and they all want different things. Um, some of them want the right to keep slaves. They brought them down from the United States in the Southern part of the United States into Texas. They are promised that they could keep slaves. Others are vehemently against it. We have abolitionists fighting the Texian army who um, think it's an abomination and that it should be um, pushed out of Texas completely. And so you've got all these different people moving in different directions. And, and really what it boils down to, uh, at least from my, my viewpoint, is that you witness the sacking of Zacatecas and the brutality of the Mexican army forced upon the Mexican people in southern Mexico. Uh, and as it moves northward into Texas, and the Texans take note of that. Okay, That is a, is a great uniter. Uh, and people who may have been sitting on the fence are now saying, okay, I can't stand idly by and watch this happen. We have to take action. And uh, that's where you get some of the Texian defenders. Uh, they're risking, some of these men are risking everything. Uh, and so, uh, and of course, some of them risk their lives and uh, pay very dearly for it at the Battle of the Alamo. Mm -hmm. as, so as Santa Ana's army moves north, what kind of condition are they in? Again, is this a crack fighting unit that it's often portrayed as? What, what kind of condition are they? Yeah, so um, there's several different accounts that, that kind of outline what the Mexican army is as it moves northward. A big one to look at is De La Pena's diary. And he says in there that they urge Santana to wait. Armies didn't usually fight in the winter time and move north you know, and, and with a big bulk army, um, several hundred miles. It, it was the the point of the army to ford up for the winter, get nice and fat, and then go out in the spring, right? And so they're they're actually urging them to wait and use caution and let them gather up supplies. The Mexican army is not a fumbling force. They're not just tossed together. You have a core group of officers and uh, senior um uh, senior officers, and then you have the younger younger officers, but then you also have the non-commissioned officers who are very good at what they do. Mm -hmm. And they have good training, and they have um, ways to get good supplies together. And unfortunately for them, the time the, the turnaround and the timetable for them with Santana is move quickly and let's get north. And so they leave without a lot of their supplies. Uh, the men aren't properly equipped. Um, you know, One of the things that always sticks out to me about Dale Pena's diary is when they hit one of the blizzards as they march north. And he says the men forgot their duty as soldiers. They drop their weapons. They let the gunpowder sit on the ground. It gets wet. Um, the, the animals are carrying their pack loads still. And um, 
He said it's completely covered in snow and the animals are breaking their necks on the on the slick ground. It's it's terrible. And the march is excruciating. And so for the Mexican army, it's it's um and it's tough. The average Mexican soldier did not have it easy. It is real bad. And then how about for what I'll call the uh Texan defenders? Some people may not be aware that there's a first battle of San Antonio, the Battle of Bejar, that brings brings some of these guys into San Antonio. You just want to talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah. So the um the precursor to the Battle of the Alamo is the Battle of Bejar, as you mentioned, and and it is truly a fight for the city. You cannot hold the Alamo without holding Bejar. You can't hold Bejar without holding the Alamo. They're they go hand in hand. And so what you've got are a, a bunch of men who who are doctors, lawyers, land surveyors, uh, farmers, and some of them are ex-professional soldiers. And they're banding together and they go and they they fight a very ferocious five day house to house, room to room battle for this the uh, to capture San Antonio, which was then the largest city in Texas. Um, these guys aren't necessarily a crack fighting unit. Um, they are an amalgamation of individuals from all over the place. And somehow they managed to get the, the job done. What you do have there is a, um, a upper kind of crust there uh, that has some training. Men like uh, Benjamin Milam, um, men like Sam Houston. Um, so you've got some of these guys that are kind of leading the charge, but I would not I'd not put them as a professional army. They're, they're more of a militia. And mm-hmm. so, um, yeah, by the time they fight the Battle of Bejar, they're 5-0 against the Mexican army, which... It's pretty emboldening at, you know, by that point. And what they don't realize is they're fighting the French of the Mexican army. The the cream of the cream is marching north and um, it's not going to go well. And so after they capture, after the, the, the Texans capture Behar, what are they told to do with the Alamo? Aren't some of them told to destroy the mission? And and how do they how does that all come about? What happens? You know, uh, yeah, that's the, so we get that question quite a bit. And why didn't uh, Bowie? Bowie is often the one that cited as he's supposed to tear down the Alamo and leave. Well, he's working with Colonel Neal, who's in charge of the Alamo, and um, this all kind of revolves around a letter that he, that James Bowie received from Sam Houston. Sam Houston does not order him to destroy the Alamo. Sam Houston gives him the option. Okay. He says, if you see fit. Remove the artillery and destroy the Alamo, reduce the walls. Why Why would Sam Houston say that? Well, again, a militia. He does not believe that the Alamo can be held with a militia. Um, they're not, you know, they're not properly trained. There's not a lot of um, people who all kind of move in one direction of thought with the militia. They're kind of all over the place. They're from all over Texas. And um, the the big thing about that is the artillery, of course, which we'll talk about. But there's, you know, there's 24 uh, cannons inside the Alamo. And... James Bowie responds back and says that he and Colonel Neal would rather die in the ditches than give up the Alamo, which was so hard. hard um, they had to fight very hard to uh, to win that after the Battle of Behar. They're not just going to give it up. And mm-hmm. so, um, yeah, Houston's giving him the option to tear to tear down the walls. But um, Bowie sees uh, that as being a terrible idea. And I tend to kind of agree with him. Um, OK. He, you know, the reason I say that is because you have all this artillery. You can't leave it for the Mexican army to take. You can't abandon supplies, but they had no wagons, uh, not, not many wagons to haul supplies away. Um, to pull all of the artillery, let's say they took every piece, which maybe they wouldn't. Maybe they would just leave some. They'd spike others. Um, but if they took them all, they'd need upwards of 70 animals to haul those cannons. And that's just to move them. The carriages were in a very pitiful state. General Coast, who was the head of the Mexican army during the Battle of Bihar, writes that they did not have a single proper carriage for any of their cannons. And it's a, that's an ongoing issue from the Spanish. Uh, the Spanish were recruiting uh, men from the United States to come down, carpenters, to build artillery um, carriages. It, it's always been an issue here in this area, mostly because there's a lack of lumber. And so even if Bowie wanted to, he couldn't properly remove all of the artillery, and the artillery in this period, as you know, which will play a huge part in civil war, it's the key to the battle if it's used properly. That's right. right. So, so James decides not to uh, abandon the Alamo, and you know, again, you know, a little bit of foreshadowing there. But he 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 writes in there he'd rather die in the ditches. Well, there you go. So that's what's <laughs> going to happen. Yeah, foreshadowing. Yeah. Well, since you've introduced us to Jim Bowie, um, 
William C. Davis's book in particular comes to mind, Three Roads to the Alamo. Yeah. In terms of really portraying Bowie as sort of a land swindler of epic proportions. What's your take on Bowie? Who is this guy? Why is he here? I would I would put Bowie as a man of opportunity. He, you know, um the people from this period are often cited as being unintelligent. Um, you know, hillbillies, especially the ones from the American South. And James is not. He speaks uh, Latin. He sp learns to speak Spanish. He teaches uh, himself partly. Um, and he speaks French. And so uh, he's well-read, um, a pretty intelligent um, man. And he's got several brothers who are also in that same boat. And every every time you see James, his brothers are there with him. And uh, they're enterprising. And for that period, there was not a lot of law and there was not a lot of federal oversight. And so people were doing whatever they wanted to do. And when it comes to land swindling, I would say, yes, partially that is true. James is uh, absolutely making fake land grants. Um, and at one point, he's taken to court by, I think, roughly 20 people in Arkansas uh, for one piece of land or something like that. It's mm -hmm. an insane amount. And so James is doing that. Well, if you look around, everyone's doing that. The federal government did not uh, really clamp down on that until uh, after, you know, 1845, 1850, when they start really getting surveyors out there and realizing how terrible uh, stuff was laid out and um, kind of this fraudulent land scheme. It, it's big. James is just a very small cog in a very large machine that was that was taking place and uh, during that period. So I would say, yes, it's true, but I would say, yeah, him and everyone else. Uh, yeah. So yeah, it's not, he's not unique in that sense. So he's uh, correct me if I'm wrong. He's married into a wealthy family. In the yeah. Bay. Yeah. Yeah. So he marries into a very wealthy family called the Veramindi family. Mr. Veramindi was a merchant and um, provincial governor of Texas. Um, very, very well liked and respected in uh, Texas and also in Bihar. His daughter, Ursula, marries James. Um, James Bowie, you know, he was, again, he's not he's not stupid, okay? He knows that marrying into a very wealthy Mexican family is going to get him not only a ton of land, but this family has money. And so um, there's that for him, but there's also enough evidence to support the idea that he actually loved his wife and she loved him. Sure. So it was a very happy marriage, despite, I think, almost a 14-year gap in age between the two of them. Um, so by all accounts, it's happy, a uh, happy marriage, but also well played by James. And so he lives in San Antonio. He's baptized in the cathedral here in San Antonio, which still stands, uh, San Fernando. And um, unfortunately, the entire Veramindi family dies of a cholera uh, pandemic that is, uh, that is spread through uh, this area. And the family goes away to Monclova and they're there whenever they contract cholera and they die. Mm -hmm. um there's the verdict is still out he may or may not have had two children okay um, but i've never seen full proof of that interesting interesting and then uh william barrett travis comes onto the scene i've always kind of liked travis again more maybe more of the hollywood dandy image in my head than than maybe the real travis and i have read what some biographies of travis that are out there but he comes onto the scene how would you how would you compare and contrast him to Bowie? because again obviously people tend to make then a lot of this so-called personality conflict between the two of them yeah i think the big thing to realize is that it's a gigantic age gap you know of, of 20 uh, almost 20 years or more and um, they're two very different individuals. You know, Travis is this young guy, uh, really trying to make a name for himself. Um, he's also well-read, um, intelligent guy. Um, unfortunately, he's tried many times to uh, make his small fortune and make a name for himself, and it has fell flat every time. And so he's had a rough go of it. Uh, James is kind of in the same boat, you know, and they both come to Texas, and that's something that will attract people to Texas um for generations is this idea of you know you can make it rich uh mm -hmm. here and if you come and you just work hard everything will work out uh and that's what attracts people like William Barrett Travis to the scene um I do think he's brave I know that some people don't like talking about bravery or the Alamo defenders were brave um we get a lot of that we get pushback on that but they were um it just it is what it is um I'm not going to put him up on a godlike pedestal either uh, but what i will say is that he is a man uh and he 
is put, he and others like James Bowie and many others are put in a very extraordinary circumstance. They do something extraordinary. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's better that we kind of talk about them as being human beings. Oh yeah. Uh, and, and not godlike because that makes them more like us and it makes the story more relatable. Um, but Travis wants to make something for himself. He wants to do something for his small family. Um, yes, he's divorced by that time he comes to Texas, but he still has children. Um, and one of them is a son. And so he has big dreams and big ideas. Unfortunately, um, they land him at the Alamo and um, of course he loses his life. But what, do, what does bring him to San Antonio? What are his orders when, when he arrives? Yeah, he's sent to, uh, to San Antonio to um, basically ford up inside the Alamo and um, remain in the area of Behar. He's a cavalryman um, initially, but uh, of course is sent uh, to a fort. And if you watch a 2004 film, they talk about um, it's not a cavalryman, uh, cavalry officer's dream to ford up. But, right. you know, Travis writes in a letter, he says, I, I'm weary to go, in, uh, and I'll paraphrase, I'm weary to go into this country with so few men, so little supplies um, to a place that he doesn't know they can actually hold. And so you've got two uh, men, uh, Bowie and Travis, who are kind of opposite of one another, as we talked about, this huge age gap, um, are going to be working together to try to hold the Alamo. Um, it's, it's pretty interesting, but uh, he's sent there um, uh, by Governor Henry Smith uh, to uh, hold the Alamo, and he's what we call a regular. He's there for a long um, enlistment, to use a modern term. And uh, James is not. James is sent as kind of a volunteer, and um, that's why they end up holding co-command of the same fort. James over the volunteers and Travis over the regulars. It is the, and again, it's often portrayed as they have this big conflict, and everybody kind of tends to side with Bowie because he's more likable and hard drinking and that sort of thing. Again, again, I'm I'm biased. Yeah. It's the Hollywood version, but where I'm going with this is fact versus fiction how how much of that do we think is actually true well we we do know that some of james Bowie's, like in the in the 2004 film since you mentioned it um some of james Bowie's men are arrested and mm -hmm. um travis says something along the lines of your your men tend to drink you know they prattle along they tend to drink and so they're in the they're in the jail and james like break them out well we know that actually happens um they're gonna try a man they're gonna court martial a man and james frees him you know so um we do know some of that happens uh, what we also know is that James is not just likable as, as far as his character, he's battle tested. Mm -hmm. You know, he's actually seen combat. Um, the Battle of uh, Concepcion is, is a great example where he's under fire um, and and uh, he, he passes through the trial of combat with flying colors and men see that. They take note of it. Travis, on the other hand, not so much. You know, um, the little bit of combat he's seen is not seen by a huge group of people, and it's not right there on center stage. So Travis has some proving to do. Okay. Yeah. Uh, whereas James didn't. And then, of course, James is prowess with a Bowie knife, and um, his reputation as a knife fighter also gets people to um, stand behind him. And then there's one other one other big fight, the Battle of San Saba, where they're surrounded by hundreds of Comanche. And he was, afterwards, he talks about how he thought for sure he was going to die. Um, uh, but he pulls through that as well. So he's got this reputation as a, you know, a guy who charges headlong into combat and comes out uh, pretty much unscathed. So he's easier to follow than a young, you know, charismatic Travis. Okay, sure. And not to put you on the spot, but how many authentic Bowie knives do you have in the Alamo collection? Do you know? Yeah. So um, authentic Bowie knives, um, are you, you mean from this period or just in general? From the from this period, I'm thinking. Oh yeah, from this period. Um, we I would say we have two knives that are associated directly with Bowie. One okay. of them being the Cyril's knife, that was made in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, that was commissioned by James's brother after James dies at the Battle of the Alamo. There's several of those out in circulation, but we have one of the finest. Um, and then we have a Bowie knife that many people consider to be the original Bowie knife that was used at the Sandbar fight. Uh, I tend to I tend to lean toward the idea that is probably the original buoy that made James famous. You know, he gets his reputation as a knife fighter, but he got in one knife fight in his entire life. Mm -hmm. And and when I tell people that on my doors, I tell them, you know, sometimes it's not how often you do something, it's how you do it. And, yeah. you know, James got his reputation. It was hard fought. Um, and so when you read about the sandbar fight, he's attacked by three men. He's stabbed, you know, s uh, several times. He's shot twice. Um, it's a pretty nasty affair. And he walks out, uh, walks away from it. 
and that can't be said for the other three men and not all of them at least. And so, um, but yeah, as far as Bowie knives, so I would, I would say we have two that are associated with the Bowie family. Uh, one that may direct, be directly associated with James himself. And then I would say that James, you know, he's not the inventor of large knives, neither is his brother reason, which they often get this, you know, title bestowed upon them as their inventor of the Bowie knife. I would say that large knives like that existed for a very long time in Texas, in particular in early Mexico. The Spanish have what's called a Belduque, which is a very large knife. It looks just like a Bowie knife. And we have dozens of those in our collection, and um, they're pretty nasty looking things. Uh, okay. I wouldn't want someone coming at me with it. <laughs> <That's for sure. laughs> Interesting. So, so then do we have this idea basically you take the regulars i'll take the volunteers do they have kind of a truce until Bowie gets sick is that generally what happens yeah it seems as though they, they kind of agree you know uh we'll we'll share command um not an even split necessarily down the middle but both men are to be respected and listened to um and, and that works out pretty well until james falls ill and he falls very very ill um very early on in the 12 day siege uh and it may be due to complications from that knife fight the sandbar fight Okay. Um, yeah, and we don't know uh, if it's typhoid or pneumonia or both, uh, but he's bedridden. So Travis, this young 26-year-old South Carolinian lawyer, is now going to hold command of the entire garrison. Okay. All right, well, before we get to the siege, you used the word godlike earlier. So, of course, the third member of the Trinity that we have not talked about yet, of course, would be David Crockett. Yeah. Uh, what's he doing in Texas? Just want to tell us where he's at at this point in his life. Yeah, um, he is. Many people would look at him and say he's on a downward trend. Okay. Um, if you, again, you know, we keep referencing the film, but it's such a good, the 2004 film is the best film on the yeah, Alamo period. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a portion of the very beginning of that film where it talks about the uh, gentleman looking at Houston and Crockett saying, you know, years, a couple of years ago, you think they were going to be in the white house. So Crockett is at this this high peak and then loses its third bid, third bid in Congress and just nosedives. Um, and it partially to do with his dislike and disdain for Andrew Jackson and what we now know is the Indian Removal Act, which would create modern-day Trail of Tears. And uh, Crockett is against that. He was a trendsetter with his, the way he thought. He never passed a single piece of significant legislation in the entire time he was in Congress. And most of that was because he believed in the rights of, the, of um, his fellow man and not just the wealthy ones, the, the ones that were less fortunate like him. Um, and he spoke out against uh, the injustices of um, the African-American people and indigenous people were facing. And because of that, he became um, kind of a, uh, you know, a black sheep of yeah. Congress and he'll lose his third bid. In Congress, and that's where he's famous for saying, you may all go to hell and I'll go to Texas. Why? Again, because Texas is this beacon, mm -hmm. this idea that if you go there, you can make it. If you, if you know, if you really put your um, nose to the grindstone and really um, work toward it, you can make something of yourself there. Matter of fact, when he gets to Texas, he writes the last letter he's ever going to write to his children. And he says, um, I'll paraphrase, but he says, um, worry not about me. I'm among friends. Uh, mm -hmm. Texas is the garden spot of the world. So he had he had went almost in a nosedive, if you will, after losing his third bid in Congress. And for him, I would say he's on the uptick. You know, things are looking up. He's going to start a new life in Texas and he'll bring his family down afterwards. And so that's why he finds himself here. The 2004 film portrays him as um, I wouldn't say a coward, but there's a scene where they uh, he says, I thought the fighting was over. Yeah. Well, in reality, Crockett knew what was happening here. Right. Um, as he's making his way down from Tennessee, um, he is writes in his journal, that he is war or writes, writes to someone or in his journal, I can't remember, um, that he is worried they will not uh, make it there before the fighting's over. So he wants to, he knows what's happening here in Texas. He's coming headlong into what he knows is a revolution and there's going to be some hard uh, battles ahead of him. And so Crockett is, is uh, willingly coming here. And I think that's there's something to be said about someone who, is willing to charge head on into uh, the fray like that. Mm -hmm. you know, it's one thing to be just caught up in it. It's another thing to join it outright and know what's what's happening and, and what the ultimate outcome could be for you. Yeah. So. And, and do we have this idea that he says he really just wants to serve as a high private or is he looking for more of a leadership role at some point? Uh, what do we know there? 
I, I think as far as it, uh, as, as it goes in the military uh, role, I think he does want to be in the lower echelon with the men. You mm -hmm. know, he was a people's person. I mean, he he really got along with the average Joe, right? So you've got all these different guys. And if he can make it among those men, I think what he's shooting for is that when the revolution's done, maybe he finds his, himself in political office again. Mm -hmm. And what better way to do that to be uh, amongst the common man, right? Sure. And so I think that's where uh, he lands himself, and it's it's on purpose. Is this idea the the so called Tennessee Volunteers that he's bringing with him? Is he really bringing in a group that he's recruited, or are these kind of just people he's picking up along the way? As David Crockett is passing from town to town into Texas, what do we know about yeah. those guys? Now, I love that question because Crockett, far and above, is the one Alamo defender who has the most mysticism yeah. and myth att attached to him it's not even close um i've i've had people tell me from tennessee that they're called the volunteer state because crockett brought all these men to the alma okay and you can't tell them that it's the war of 1812 <laughs> and you cannot and so um so there's this idea that when they walk in the church people modern visitors um when they walk in the church they see the the Tennessee flag there, and we have streamers on each flag that has a number that designates the number of individuals that were born in that nation or state that came to the Alamo and died on the morning of March 6th, and Tennessee has the most, 32. Mm -hmm. And everyone assumes it's Crockett and 31 other men. Well, <laughs> really what it is, is it's Crockett and about four or five other guys. Okay. It's not very many people. Um, okay. And so, you know, um, he brings with them some family. Um, he brings with them a couple men who get really sick and they have to leave them behind. One of them is Benjamin McCullough, who, of course, will die at the Battle of Pea Ridge. Um, they were very good friends, and he gets very sick, and Crockett leaves them behind. And so he misses the Battle of the Alamo. But that, that should tell you, again, how Crockett is in a hurry to get down here. Uh, and so, but, yeah, I, you know, he just has a lot of myth around him, and I think it's because he was like a rock star of his day. Yeah. I mean, he is the Elvis Presley of the 1830s. It's just insane. And so uh, when it comes to Crockett, there's just a lot of questions. Yeah. Yeah. So I've kind of taken the easy way out here. I've I've asked you about the big three. Is there anybody that you you sort of bias towards? Do you have, you know, I hate to use the word favorite defender. Do you have somebody that you really like? Or is there somebody yeah. like a, a Juan Seguin or that that you just wish people would talk more about? You know, I think that the other defenders, they they no one talks about them very much unless you're mm -hmm. in Texas and you start meeting some of the family, the descendants of these men, and they're they're proud of their family. Um, a couple of people who I really love everyone to look at a little bit more is is James Butler Bonham is is one probably my favorite if you if you force me to pick an Alamo defender, and he was you know we call about kind of the Trinity like you said the three but there were four up until like especially around 1936 with the Centennial. <clears throat> it started going up until about 1950 and then the film came out and then Bonham kind of, kind of just falls off. Um, Bonham is a great example of, of a, um, a kind of a, a true patriot. He comes to Texas with um, ideas of serving in the military. He writes and asks for a commission and he says, I don't want any land. I don't want money. I want nothing in return. I just want to fight. I want mm -hmm. to serve, which is, is huge. Um, he comes from a very wealthy planting family in uh, Saluda, South Carolina. He is the black sheep of that family um, in, in a sense that he doesn't believe in slavery uh, like his family does, or at least not okay. as vehemently as they do. Um, and he was a, a lawyer, a practicing lawyer, and he would represent the underrepresented African Americans and, and women. And there's one instance where he's um, representing a woman and the judge speaks very poorly of her and he says, I'm going to tweak your nose. And it just goes to show, I mean, he he was a fighter. And um, if he believed in something, he he really worked toward that. And I just think it's admirable that he comes into Texas when so many people are demanding, you know, I want a promotion to this and I want this many acres. I want to make sure I get paid. And, you know, we have a huge falling out in the Texan army over money. And, and here's this guy coming and saying, I don't want anything. I want nothing. I just want to fight. And um, also during the 12-day siege, risked his life several times to carry dispatches, which was a dangerous, dangerous job. And so um, for those reasons, I just think he's he's pretty great. And I'm not sure exactly why people stop talking about uh, about him. Um, 
But the other one I would say is, uh, you know, Ben Milam. I know he's not an Alamo defender, but Benjamin Milam is the reason why the Alamo takes place. Yeah, had he not urged the men to go in to fight in the Battle of Behar, and he ultimately loses his life there, um, the Battle of the Alamo would have never taken place, and Texas probably would not have won its independence. Mm-hmm. So those those are two. Yeah. Great. No, that's that's great. We um, so obviously I could sit here and talk to you all day, but we should probably. <laughs> Probably keep things moving along here. So we should probably move things up to the siege. Do you a couple thoughts here? One, just the books I've read over the years, the number of defenders in the Alamo during the siege seems to fluctuate based on new research or whatever. So that'll sort of be my first question. How do you think how many guys ultimately do you think are in there? But then related to that, Santa Ana as he arrives in San Antonio, there's sort of a perception that he kind of keeps catches the gang off guard maybe they're having a fandango washington's birthday or something like that there's at least a perception that these guys then are kind of caught off guard and then have to really fall back kind of pell-mell into the alamo you want to talk to us just about that and and what really happens yeah yeah so um you know with the, the alamo defenders we put the number at 189 and okay. and we say it could be as high as 200 there are a lot of names that float around out there that are unsubstantiated and, um, you know, how it went for a very long time is that if you claimed that your ancestor fought or died at this battle in, Tex- in the Texas Revolution or they served during the Republic period, as my ancestors did, someone had to come forward and prove that. You had to have a letter from somebody. Juan Seguin is a perfect example. He signs um, notices for many, many Texians who served during the Revolution. And he says, yes, I saw that man serving here or there. Um, and in what we end up with are people who claim that they're at the Alamo, but no one can substantiate it. So we have that. And then we just have names that were just pulled out of a hat. You know, they sound similar to another Alamo defender. So you end up with two of them. And so uh, there's this kind of, of a wide mix. Um, we have 189. It really could be as low as 186 because there's a couple of names that probably should be um, scratched off the list. Now with today's climate, I don't think uh, we could ever, remove names from the list but we certainly right. could add them and so as you mentioned research as it as it kind of moves along and we get these archives that are being digitized we get more access to stuff we've never seen before and certainly that that list in our lifetime could go as high as 200 okay it just could um it's i wouldn't say it's extremely likely but it's a possibility uh for sure so you have 189 men inside the alamo um and are they caught off guard well yes and no one they know that Sesma is at the Rio Grande. Uh, they know that early March, uh, very, very early March, I think on the 3rd. Um, they know that Santana is moving northward. Um, so it's not like they were all hanging out um, and then the MX Army is boom, just out of nowhere. They knew they were coming. I just don't think that they knew at the rapid pace they were moving. Right. Okay. And, that, you know, and so that's really what happens where you have these, you know, the, okay, well, they'll be here, but we have time. Oh no, they're here, and so it's it's more of that kind of caught off guard than um, than the Mexican army just being you know appearing out of the ether, if you will. And so, um, yeah, I it, the movie does a very good job of it in two thousand four of the, the chaos, but in reality, the Texans knew where the Mexican army was; they just didn't realize they were moving that quickly. Okay, so we we hole up in the Alamo. You touched on it before, but just to kind of come back to this. How how soon into this does Bowie get sick? Really, again, turning everything over to Travis. Yeah, he's. I think he's sick by the second day of the siege. Yeah. You know, and we're talking about twelve day siege. Day two, he's bedridden. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't mean he's um, completely unresponsive. He's probably still uh, talking with Travis about things uh, that need to be done or things that he would do. Um, but they fort up almost immediately. Uh, Next army parades into town without firing a shot, and the Texans realize they're in a pretty tight spot. Um, the Mexican army, you know, there's kind of this, we, we, we looked at this during COVID and we had a lot of time for research, you know, Travis fires this shot, right. As the Mexican army comes into town, the Mexican army says that they were shot at by the fort. And they even go as far as to say it was the 18 pounder, which is in the Southwest corner. Uh, we don't know if the red flag was raised first and Travis fires a shot or if Travis fires a shot and they promptly raise the red flag. What we do know is that the, the Alamo defenders probably knew that they were going to be put to the sword before the Mexican army even got there. Because one of the um, newspaper accounts I've read is that General Sesma, who's in charge of the cavalry for the Mexican army, says he's going, uh, at least they claim he says, he's going to kill every white man in Texas. And so 
there's already this idea they're going to be put to the sword. This was not news to them, which again adds another layer to the story. These yeah. guys, they're they're fighting knowing full well that they're probably going to be put to the sword. That's that's pretty damning. Yeah, yeah, it is. And you mentioned the pirate concept earlier, so I guess the only other thing that I'm thinking is this idea then that the the Texans had paroled Mexican prisoners, basically let them go after the first battle of Bayard did apparently did not buy any goodwill with anybody. Yeah, you know, um, General Coase, who's in charge of the Mexican army, is allowed to leave with, I think he's allowed to take one cannon and they're allowed to keep their weapons and in, in a, a certain amount of ammunition. And they're told to never come back and fight against um, Texas again. But there's kind of a loophole there because the Texans were uh, fighting for the Constitution of 1824 to be reinstated under that flag. Well, when Coase returns, Texas is now claiming independence. It's a okay. whole different deal. So, um, you know, Coase very well may have said, you know, I don't really care what I said. I'm coming back anyway. Or he could have been saying, well, the cause has changed, therefore I can return. And so it didn't buy, buy very much goodwill at all. Um, the Texans you know, they're going to be put to the sword and it's, it really boils down to the Tornado decree and Santana will carry that out to the letter. Okay. So yeah. then two, two, two thoughts there as we kind of segue from that, you talked about declaring independence. We haven't touched on Sam Houston a lot during the conversation here, yeah. but Travis, well, let me start with Travis. Travis obviously writes these great communications full under victory or death, double yeah. mind and all that good stuff. Um, you know, I've seen that characterized by some prominent Texas historians as well. If you read between the lines, he's basically saying, send reinforcements, please help. So my question related to that would be, what exactly is Sam Houston and the rest of this fledgling Texas doing while the men are holed up in the Alamo? Yeah, uh, there is a huge myth surrounding this letter and the, the letters that are coming out from Travis and others. Uh, during the siege. And the myth is that the men in the Alamo were inside the fort making time for Sam Houston to bring his army together. That's just a myth. I mean, when the Alamo falls, Sam Houston has a handful of men with him. Um, Sam Houston's not gathering an army. Sam Houston, you know, um, is trying to uh, get things together, but they don't have an army at that point. So what the men in the Alamo are doing really is they're going to end up being martyrs. I mean, and the martyrdom at the Alamo ends up um, pushing a lot, spurring a lot of people to join the, the newly fledgling Texas army, and then it grows and blossoms into something else. I I often wonder, and I don't know the answer to this, if the Alamo, um, let's say that, you know, James Bowie had left, and he decided to tear down the walls and leave. Mm -hmm. uh, would the army have grown as it did? Would you have had this big push of people to not sit on the fence, but to join the cause? I, I don't know. Um, and I, 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 I kind of think that it wouldn't have. Okay. Um, I think that you need the sacrifice at the Alamo and at Goliad to get people moving in the right direction. I mean, it, it worked for my family. Um, you know, my seventh great grandfather and his uh, three sons all started fighting in, um, or at least joined up in September, but they didn't really take place in any big battles until the Battle of San Jacinto. And mm -hmm. I, I think that that's a big part of it. You know, it's like, okay, well, we saw all this this mass uh, execution of all these men, some of which were my neighbors. I'm not going to stand for that. And so they joined the cause. Um, but yeah, there's um, there's a lot of that that kind of myth surrounding um, Houston and this the growing of the Texan army. But in reality, uh, there's a lot of chaos. It's yeah. complete and utter chaos. And there's not a lot of organization. He's certainly not mustering up men uh, for an army. Um, they're, they're getting ready to pack up and move north and east okay. away from the Mexican army. Yeah, so... Um, there's also a myth surrounding that 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 the garrison did not know that uh, independence had been declared. And for a long time, our film said that on site, you know. Um, but the reality is that we sent, or the Alamo sent two delegates to uh, the convention, so they knew uh, what was happening. They voted on behalf of the garrison. So the men knew they were being declared independent. What they didn't realize is that independence would be won, right? There's no right. way they could know that. So, right. you know. Well, you mentioned Goliad, so let's talk about Fanon, if we could, for a moment. What's your assessment of what's going on with him? Man, if you mention Fanon in a positive light in this in the, in the circles that I, I roam in, um, you'll get a lot of heat. And I do. Almost every time someone brings up Fanon, I say, you know, hey, he gets a bad rap. 
and everyone's like, oh, up in arms. And and you know, the number yeah. one thing that people will say is that, well, Fanon didn't come in um relieve Yama. Well, no one came to relieve Yama except for the 32 men from Gonzalez. Um, the other thing is that they'll say, well, he was given orders to go and relieve the fort. He was also given uh, at least two other sets of orders saying not to do that. So this young officer is getting tugged in every direction. Um, you know, he's touted as a West Point man. Well, he's at West Point for like 11 months. It's not right. very long, right? Not long enough to learn uh, great tactics. And the big one is that, well, he got his entire command killed. And to that, I would say, well, so did Travis and Bowie. Do we give them the same, you know, uh, treatment as is uh, Fannin? So what I would say about Fannin is that he's young, he's enterprising, and um, he is not a coward. Um, he proves that on the field of battle several times, so along with James Bowie, at the, you know, uh, I believe he's at the Battle of Concepcion. Um, so he's not a coward. What I think is is that he is, um, I think he runs into it full charge himself. And when he becomes a commander, he does not think about, you know, who's following behind me when I do that, right? Um, and I think that it, it gets his men killed, ultimately, yes. Um, but the other thing that people talk about is that he tried to resign his commission. Mm -hmm. He said, I don't want this. I, I don't want it. I was wrong. You know, he had asked for the commission. Now, all of a sudden, he doesn't want it. Uh, and, and they tell him no. So I think when an officer realizes that they're probably in uh, too deep, and they're wanting to be uh, relieved of command. Um, sometimes those orders should be, or those those requests should be looked at a little bit more thoroughly. Had they been, you could have put someone in charge of that command that would have had a little bit more experience, um, and it probably wouldn't have got everyone killed. There's uh, something that Ernesto Rodriguez, a senior curator and historian, um, who you've met at the Allen, he's been there 25 years. Something he laughs about a little bit when it comes to Fannin is that. At the Battle of Concepcion, where do the Texans run to? They run to a ditch and tree line. And they use that as um, a way to fire at the Mexican army to keep them at bay. He doesn't learn from his mistake. At the battle, um, at, at the battle will eventually um, be defeated, Battle of uh, Coleta Creek. He's only a couple hundred yards or less from a tree line and a ditch that had water in it. And he stops his command in the middle of an open field. Yeah. And yeah. And so I, I just I, I kind of touted it up to him being um, young and um, a, a, a bit of a go getter and not really thinking out the situation fully. Does he deserve some blame? Yeah, he does. Yeah. He made some poor decisions. But whenever it comes down to I think the chief complaint people have about him is getting his entire command killed. And uh, like I said, I well, so did Bowie and Travis, you know, but some for some reason they're heroes and, um, you know, uh, you get fan and he's the hesitant martyr right so that's the book is aptly named um so yeah i, I don't know i i look at him as just another patriot uh yeah. and unfortunately lost his life yeah we have been we have made stops at that last battlefield of his and mm, was a little bit of a head scratcher on that one not that i'm any great military genius but yeah i'm not either really fanning but yeah 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 that's right so, i mean ultimately is the perception between the two teams as simple as in the public's mind, one team goes down swinging and the other one surrenders. Is it is it that much of a simple difference in how we view, as you said, Travis and Bowie, quote unquote, getting all their men killed versus how Fannin does it? I think that Bowie and Travis have a great uh, PR machine behind them. <laughs> okay. Right. I mean, how many movies do you did you see all the movies about Goliath? No, because there aren't any. Right. I think that um, I think that early on, the treatment of Travis and Bowie are they're treated very good, um, partly because the letters from the garrison, Travis's letters, are very poetic. They're great. And they, they pull at the heartstrings, uh, fan and not so much, right? Yeah. And um, you know, then you don't have two huge blockbuster movies to back uh, fan and Goliad. If he did, and he was portraying a more positive light, we may we may also portray him that way. Um, but you know, we talked about. A little bit. I don't want to get off topic, but we talked about Travis's letters, and one of them that's one of my favorites. So we kind of joke about it a little bit is uh, one of his letters. Basically, he says, "You need to send me reinforcements and supplies, or my bones will reproach yeah. you." Basically, I'm going to haunt you for the rest of your life if you don't help us. Um, you know, and so I think that really what it boils down to is not necessarily going down swinging or one surrendering. I think it. I think really what it what it is is the PR, the propaganda machine behind um travis and Bowie. it's it's massive okay fair enough yeah. 
And as we get into the propaganda machine, how about the line in the sand? What yes. Well, think? oh man, one of my favorite myths. Um, you know, and I, I should correct. I shouldn't say myth. We put that like squarely in the. Um, oh gosh, I want to say not not myth. We call it. We can have another name for it. Um, basically, you know that the line in the sand very well may have happened. Um, we we know something like that had to have happened because mm -hmm. the men are given an ultimatum. You know, you can either run or you can stay. Right. So at one point or another, every Alamo defender had a line in the sand in his in his mind, in his letters home, uh, or his conversations with the other men inside the garrison. What I really think happens, and, and this is just my opinion, is that Battle of Behar, you've got Benjamin Milam. And the witnesses there said that when he stands up and motivates the men to go in and fight the Battle of Bihar, he takes his rifle butt and draws a line in the dirt. And right. that, he says, who will follow Ben Milam into town? I think that line in the sand has, that story exists and has been kind of moved over and put on Travis. You know, since the events were so close mm -hmm. together, I think that early on, put in the newspapers and on uh, the writings, uh, that Travis is the one that drew the line in the sand. Uh, and, you know, then you've got Moses Rose and uh, Zuber, who who really pushed that. And and when you look at the analysis behind that, man, there's a lot of truth in there. And there's a lot of um, stuff that just doesn't add up, especially with uh, Moses Rose. But, you know, what really takes place is that Moses Rose and Zuber work together to push their own stories. And when people started questioning it, um Zuber would say, well, my mother is the one that spoke with Rose. Are you calling my mother a liar? You know, and of course, no one wants to call someone's mom a liar. But, right. you know, I, I think that the men inside the Alamo garrison, absolutely every one of them had a conversation or thought about a line in the sand. Do I stay or do I fight? And okay. do I think Moses Rose uh, was there? I think he was. Do I think Travis drew a line in the sand? I do not. Okay. But I do think he had a conversation with his men to talk about sacrifice. You know, and to talk about what they were doing there and and why it was important to stay. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I just think um, I think that Moses Rose, you know, he's another one who gets a lot of heat, a lot, lot of flack from him. Uh, but again, not a coward. Fought in the Napoleonic Wars. You know, um, had been tested in combat and seen the cruelty of man. And um, I think he knew when to throw in the towel. You know, he's in his mid fifties, early fifties. So. Yeah, uh, no line in the sand for me. Uh, Moses Rose is partly believable. Uh, so is Zuber. And uh, now it goes down in history. And and, it, and again, it plays a role, right, in public memory and how we see the sign. Yeah. yeah. Well, Moses Rose was going to be my next question. So I'll take I'll keep that under advisement, I guess, the next time I'm reading my Alamo accounts. So you're you're again, at least thinking he's there for what uh, he's saying. Yeah, I think there's enough evidence to support that he's there. Mm -hmm. I, I think he takes, um, you know, if, if you read about uh, him, he recites Travis's speech in its entirety. Yeah. You know, and he was a great, he didn't speak a lot of uh, English, but he was great reciting it word for word. And the story doesn't change. And therefore, people start believing more and more of it. <clears throat> but one thing you can see in his account, he says how moving and how powerful the speech was and how motivating was. I was like, whoa, it was so powerful and so motivating that you left the garrison. <laughs> so uh, I think I think there's enough to support that he's there. Uh, I don't think there's enough to support the line in the sand. Um, but again, it's one of those enduring uh, parts of the Alamo story. Keeps mm -hmm. people talking. Yeah, it sure does. Okay, so you're an artillery guy. Let's talk a little bit about siege tactics. Awesome. Just kind of work us through the siege here and what what kind of tactics Santa Ana lays down on the garrison. And at the same time, based on whatever internal evidence we may still have, what do we think the guys inside the walls are, are doing? Yeah, the guys inside the walls are, um, they're trying to stall, right? They're hoping that a larger force will come in and relieve them. Um, that either they can squeeze out or they can squeeze enough men in to hold the garrison and and push the Mexican army back. It's not going to be possible uh, with the numbers that the Mexican army is bringing in. Um, but they are they are kind of stalling in that sense. Uh, Jameson, the engineer for the site, is working on a plan to reduce the size of the fort. They were doing that before the siege even began. He wanted to square it off, which would make it a lot easier to defend instead of this long rectangle mm -hmm. with a kind of another rectangle on the backside. Um, so they're working on that. They're going to be trying to prop up the walls. They're in... Some portions of the Alamo walls are in a uh, great state of disrepair. 
And so there's that going on. And then we know the carriages that the artillery is sitting on are in very poor shape. We know that. Uh, the six pounder that comes in from uh, the Battle of Gonzales uh, is brought in on an old cotton wagon axle. So, you know, it's a mess. The 18 pounder arrives in the Gulf of Texas. Not only did they forget the ammunition in New Orleans um, or in Louisiana that they forgot the ammunition for the gun, they also don't have a carriage for it. So when it arrives, it's got brand new wheels and no carriage. They have to Frankenstein this thing together. So the garrison's busy doing things like that. The Mexican army is busy digging uh, emplacements for their artillery, and they're going to shell the compound for 12 straight days. The Mexican army did not bring large enough cannons to actually pummel the walls or breach them with their guns. As a matter of fact, uh, General Podilla, who's in charge uh, uh, of the Mexican artillery, is chastised by Santana and told, if you don't breach the walls with the artillery, you won't take play, uh, part in the, the actual battle, right? The battle to come. So there's a lot of... Um, artillery being fl uh, flung at the Alamo. And this is something that's been pretty interesting to me is that, you know, we've always heard that the Alamo walls were completely, you know, basically rubble, right? And what we did recently uh, within the past three years, is we met with the History Channel um, and they recreated part of the Alamo wall using the techniques they would have used back then. And then we shot it with a six pound cannon and we shot it 75 yards with a, I think a pound of powder. And it, the walls, you know, of the Alamo range from anywhere from two to five foot thick. We're, we're not entirely sure. They're very, they're very thick walls. Out of the two and a half foot, three foot section we were looking at, the ball went in about six inches. And so the six pounders and the eight pounders the Mexican army have, um, or sorry, the uh, eight pounders and smaller caliber uh, cannons the Mexican army have are not enough to breach those walls. So that's what you have going on. You've got the Mexican army encircling. They're running cavalry screens. The Texans are holding out. I got a lot of flack recently at a talk I did for the Sons of the Republic of Texas. Uh, one of the members uh, asked me if the, the garrison had enough gunpowder for their, their guns and their cannons. I said, yes, they did. Someone came up afterward and said, that's not true, you know. And um, I, I said to him, well, why do you think that? And he said, well, Travis writes a letter asking for more gunpowder. It's like, well, yeah, Travis is stalling and hoping, you know, that they can hold out. Travis doesn't know if this is going to be two weeks or three months, right? So he wants as much powder and, and ball as he could possibly get. But what we do know is the Mexican army captures hundreds of rounds and they claim there's powder with the rounds, hundreds of them. And then they capture 20,000 rounds of ammunition for the firearms, small arms. That, now that gunpowder can be taken out of all those, those um, um, cartridges and you can use gunpowder to fire a cannon. You don't need cannon grade powder every time to shoot a cannonball, right? So I would say they had... They end up having enough. Hmm. Could they have had more? Yes. So there's there's a lot of things going on inside the garrison. The Mexican army is obviously ramping up and building up to this big moment, which will happen on the morning of March 6th. Um, and the uh, other thing I would mention is that the Mexican artillery is making its way north. There are 12 pounders, heavy siege guns that will arrive. They end up arriving, I think, one or two days after the battle takes place. So they get mm -hmm. there late. Okay. And Santana, yeah, and Santana's generals asked them, you know, like, why don't we wait, wait till the guns show up? And of course, that doesn't happen. Well, yeah, that's a great segue into the next question. And why doesn't Santa Ana wait any longer? Why does he decide, you know, today's the day we're going to go? You know, I, I, I don't know that I've ever read the exact reason why he chose to move forward. I think he was just tired of the siege. Tired, you know, at yeah. this point, okay. they're months into this. You know, uh, not in Texas necessarily, but the revolution is and down in Mexico was tough for the Mexican army. Uh, they've been on campaign for a very long time. Um, and so I think he's just ready to get it over with. And I think he knows that he can throw his men at the garrison. They know how many men are inside, or at least roughly, and that they held the fort prior to December of 1835, and they know exactly how to attack it. I mean, his men built the uh, palisade wall, and they built the uh, front, or the, at least the lunette, on the front gate. And so I think he just thinks, well, we'll just throw men at it and we'll make it happen. And he, I mean, he's right. He suffers heavy casualties because of it, but he was right. Yeah. So what is, what is the battle plan? What does he try to do? Yeah. So uh, basically uh, he's hoping to hit the apex of uh, the fort. I mean, that's the standard tax of the time period. Hit the apex of the corner so that you have to spread men out to defend them. Um, he knows the compound is huge. So he spreads his army out into several veins and attacks those corners. And um, the Texans obviously can't spread themselves out far enough 
Um, you have all these great cannons that could have been uh, used to great effect, except you don't have enough men to run them and man the walls. And so Santana spreads the uh, defenders out. And instead of attacking the main gate and going through the main gate, he just climbs the walls or has his men climb the walls and they breach it that way. And the breach, the first breach occurs on the north wall, which by all accounts is the weakest. And um, after that, the southwest corner falls and then back behind um, the modern day lawn barrack and um, kind of just uh, falls from there. And the last bastions of men are going to be inside the lawn barrack itself in the church. Mm -hmm. And of course, we think Travis is at the north wall and is killed relatively early based on Joe's account. Yeah, um, that's one account that I've never really questioned is Joe's account. He gives okay. it immediate, almost immediately after the battle and it, it doesn't change. Um, and you know, of course he's not around very much longer after that, but, uh, he, that, that account has never been really brought into question and it works. It jives well with the series of events that the Mexican army gives, but Travis on the North wall fighting in the opening minutes of the battle and is shot and not killed immediately, uh, rolls down the ramp and is still alive. And, you know, if you look at the death of Travis, which is a pretty prominent painting we have inside the Alamo, it shows him with a bullet hole in, in the middle of his forehead. And, and I really, um, when I first started working the Alamo, myself and several others, we always kind of laughed at that. It's like, well, he's got a bullet hole in his, in his forehead, right? He's not fighting anymore. Um, but many years have gone by. And if you look at the medical manuals of that period and some of the um, treaties on gunshot wounds, mm -hmm. I don't know if you've read that book or not. No, no, um, no, no. Fantastic book on um, um, velocity and uh, bullets and trajectory and things of that nature. And when you start to realize the Mexican army had poor powder, um, their muskets weren't very accurate as we know all muskets weren't it's not that they're bad shots um and you know if the if the powder was already poor quality and then it got wet on the trip up it's probably got very very little potency and it's very possible that he got hit in the forehead and it makes a pretty nasty wound but it doesn't kill him mm -hmm. um the mexican army says that when they climb the wall they come over and they saw him and basically he lunges up and kills an officer and the officer stabs him and they both die you know, so um, I think I really kind of chalked it up to the distance of the ball where it was fired from, the right. quality of the gunpowder. And uh, but at any rate, he dies on the north wall. Joe witnesses his death and Joe gives that account. And I, I, I find that to be really accurate. OK. And Bowie killed in his bed. Yeah. Bowie and Bowie on the um, in on the southern portion of the fort in the, what we call the low barrack, which is uh, currently under construction. We're, we're reinterpreting that whole section. Um, in his bed now there's some myths surrounding this does does Bowie go down fighting uh or does he um you know die he's kind of in and out of it uh my opinion uh just me as colby not uh as the alamo is that james dies before the battle okay and there's an account that talks about james um there's a couple it says one that he's hiding under his bed sheets like a coward okay well james was a lot of things but not a coward i wouldn't put him in that category at all um, and so you look at that, that account, well, why would he be under his bed sheets? Well, is it possible that he succumbs to his illness and that, you know, Travis doesn't want to demoralize the entire garrison by telling him that Bowie is dead. So they wrap him up in his bed sheets to prep him for burial. And they never actually got a chance to bury him. That's okay. what I think likely happened. Um, but the other scenario is that he's got a pair of pistols and his Bowie knife nearby and he, he goes down fighting. It's, it's certainly possible. I just put it in the problem that kind of the category is highly unlikely. Right. Well, yeah. since since you indicated before before we get to the big one, I, I'm sure you can guess where I'm going to go. But <laughs> before we get to the big one, what about uh, your favorite Bonham? Do we know anything about his his last moments or what happens to him? Unfortunately, not um, a lot about him. We think he may have died in the church. OK. Uh, manning the three cannons that are inside there with Captain Amaron Dickinson and several others um it's hard to say you know they they say that um several of the men are kind of sporadically stationed they're moving around the fort you know it's a big area a lot of uh, space to defend and it very well could be that he was in one place someone saw him there and then he moved to another on the morning of the battle uh, but from what i've read he's in the church okay i know there's been some um some suggestion that during the closing phases a good number of the garrison does try to escape out to the east and then is ultimately cut down by the cavalry. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, very unpopular in Texas to talk about the tech, you know, the Alamo defenders 
we're treating um, or running. And what I what I remind people about that account is that we do that in the current military. It's called a tactical retreat. You're leaping and bounding, right? So you're you're um, retreating to live another day and fight another day, right? Mm-hmm. So they're looking for a better uh, position to continue the fight. And I truly do believe there's at least one, possibly two uh, groups of men that squeeze out the southern portion of the fort and fight in the field that's in that area. The main reason I believe that is because General Sesma, who's the head of the art, uh, the uh, cavalry, says it. Yeah. And he says that he has to send several groups of lancers over there to um, put them in down. And he says they actually leave the fort in an organized fashion. They're marching in a group. Yeah. You know, and so um, you have that. And then he says that another group made it out into a ditch and they fight ferociously from the ditch. And so, yeah, I think that there are men who escape. I think it's completely normal, you know, in a scenario like that, right? You're 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 tactically retreating to fight from an, another uh, position. Um, and it doesn't have anything to do with being a coward. It's a smart move in a situation like that. You see the that the north wall's been breached, southwest corner's been breached, and you've got one of two places to go. Well, you have the church or the lawn bear. I'm gonna try to take that open field and you know run for it to mm-hmm. live fight another day. Yeah, yeah, I can't argue with that. Yeah. So ultimately, how would you characterize the battle itself? Uh, does the do the defenders truly inflict a crippling blow? on the Mexican army in terms of casualties. Um, how, how do you characterize yeah. it? I, I wouldn't say that they put a crippling blow on uh, the Mexican army as far as the death toll. Yeah. But I think that they, they uh, partially cri- cripple it through morale. Okay. I mean, that's a lot. They lose the Mexican army loses 400 to 600 killed or wounded, depending on what source you cite. There's a lot of them out there. Uh, yeah. Santana, I think he says they lose like 28 men or something, um, which is not possible. Um, but 400, 600 men, that's a lot of people. And, um, you know, that had to be demoralizing for the men who were left over. Um, and so you have that. The medical corps is non-existent. There is no medicine. Uh, for point of reference, when the Battle of the Alamo happens, about a month later, Goliad happens. And the doctors and male nurses from Goliad are brought to the Alamo to take care of the Alamo wounded. Those men had laid there for 30 plus days. Mm. You know, gunshot wounds, things like that, stab wounds. And so um, that has to be a demoralizing thing uh, for the Mexican army to endure. So that is is a small victory in itself. And then, of course, the mass of people who hear about what happened, you know, and um, some people say, you know, these letters that Travis wrote and sent out to all, the, you know, all Americans in the world. They didn't do anything. They were a failure. No one came to to um, support them. That's unequivocally false. They work. They just they're delayed. You know, those letters get into the hands of people in New Orleans who immediately start packing up their stuff and head to Texas. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so there's there's a, there's of course it's a loss for Texas, but there's several small victories within that um, that the, the men at the Alamo they they fought dearly for. Okay. And here we come. So, of course, then there are reports that a few prisoners are rounded up and ultimately executed. Uh, Probably most people listening know know where this is going. But uh, Crockett, what's what's your take on the death of David Crockett? Man, um, I truly believe Crockett dies during the battle. Okay, I think I think he just dies outright. Um, you know, there's a lot of propaganda on both sides immediately from the beginning of the revolution till the end. And then, of course, through uh, statehood for Texas, there's all kinds of propaganda. And I I talk to people about this. I say, well, you know, how do you get people to get off that fence, the proverbial fence we've been talking about, to join the, the, the cause? You've got this rock star of his age dying at the Alamo. Not only does he die, he's brutally executed without a firearm to defend himself. He's defenseless. That makes a lot of people angry. And um, the fact that, you know, he's just put down like a, like a rabid dog is not not something that a lot of people are going to enjoy hearing. And so mm-hmm. that spurs people in uh, to join the Texian cause. Um, it demonizes the Mexican army. Mm-hmm. Right. What kind of what kind of people would kill a defenseless person? And so I think it's used as propaganda. Um, they don't name any of the other people that are there. Right. These other five or six men, not a single one of them. We don't know who they are. Uh, but we'd know for a fact it's Crockett, you know, it just sounds um, a little bit too far-fetched for me uh, to believe. 
Uh, I, I just think that, uh, you know, he's killed in the battle and then that's used as propaganda to try to push the cause. Okay. Interesting. Not the answer I was expecting from you. Um, so that's <laughs> okay. And now I know though, well, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I believe from some of our past conversations and you touched on it at the beginning of this conversation, uh, that you are a believer in the authenticity of the, the Della Pena diary. Now I know, accounts of Crockett's execution also comes from other places, but in terms of the diary itself, that's kind of the one that most people know about or, yeah. or hear about. And so then just to clarify, uh, are you a believer in the authenticity of that document? I am. I'm a believer in 99% of that diary. I think that, you know, he's putting a lot of his opinions and himself in there as a hater of Santana uh, and an enemy of Santana in later years. Um, so there's there's that side of it, uh, but I think that he does justice to the story of what's happening in um, during the revolution, and I don't think he changes his tune very much whenever it comes to that portion. You know, I should say too, it's like we'll never truly know what happened to Crockett, right? Sure. We just don't we don't know. We will never know. I can almost guarantee you that. You know, he either goes down swinging, uh, or um, you know, he's executed, and I don't think it truly matters. Right. It doesn't it you know it doesn't matter. It doesn't change what happened there. You know, he sacrifices his life. Um, but you know, I think John Wayne kind of you know, it could it caused two camps to kind of you know sprout up. And um yeah, I think people should believe what they want to believe, but realize that it doesn't truly matter what happened. What, ma what matters is that he sacrificed himself for something greater than himself. And I would thoroughly agree with you on that assessment. So we don't unfortunately have time then to continue through the closing stages of the Texas revolution. I wish we did, but um, maybe I'll try to summarize it this way. You've talked a little bit about the, the morale effect that you think the Alamo has really on both sides of the fence. You know, today there's, well, culturally there's been people criticizing the Alamo for, for a number of years, but I th I'm thinking of recent books such as forget the Alamo and things of that nature. Yeah. So I'll, I'll kind of summarize, ask you to summarize it all this way. Why do you think we should still remember the Alamo? I think that we still need to remember the Alamo because it's who we are as Americans. Mm -hmm. um, there have been a thousand Alamos in our nation's history where people, you know, believed in a cause. So um, they were so, they're so, and they believe in the cost so much that they are willing to lay down their lives. You know, if you look at some of the pay stubs, you know, basically pay stubs of the period for some of the defenders, some of those men died and they got their families got paid sixteen dollars. Mm -hmm. That's you're selling your life, you know, pretty dearly sixteen bucks. Um, so when you really start to think about it, um, they had to have believed in the cause full heartedly to go uh, or with a full heart to go right into the fray and lose their life. And, you know, we're living in a pretty privileged uh, time in American history. We should probably give them the benefit of the doubt there. So we we need to remember the Alamo because if we don't, then we'll, we'll forget what it's like to be an American or a Texan. Um, the Alamo should be seen as a great uniter uh, for us instead of a great divider. OK, which is a great kind of coming full circle then to some of the uh, projects you were talking about at the beginning of the conversation. Uh, you want to just tell us real quick things that are going on at the Alamo right now, projects that you're excited about? Yeah, man, we we are in the middle of the largest or one of the largest or if not the largest museum project in the entire United States at the moment. Uh, the state legislature has given us a little over $400 million to revamp the plaza and take care of both the historic church and the lawn barrack. Uh, for future generations and build a 151,000 square foot museum across the street from the Alamo. The state has uh, slowly purchased all of those buildings. And uh, we're not only going to have a world-class museum with eight total galleries, starting with the pre-contact phase uh, prior to um, the Spanish Entrada, all the way through to John Wayne. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to have that, but we're also going to have a 4D theater um, that is going to knock your socks off. We're excited about that. Uh, the Alamo's never had anything. Um, that people could come and really get a grasp of our story. And so that's big, but it doesn't stop there. We've uh, reinterpreted the southern part of the fort through the Palisade. Uh, a new uh, new 18-pounder mm -hmm. exhibit's coming soon. And we've uh, reinterpreted the south uh, gate and lunette. I mean, it, it, things are really changing wow. there. Yeah. Uh, we've shut down two streets, working on another one. Um, so there'll be foot traffic only, and the entire plaza is going to be revamped. I mean, it's... Things are really moving fast. If you haven't been to the Alamo in the past 
you know, year, year and a half, you have to come down and see what we're doing. It's, it's, it's a game changer. Um, yeah, it's big. Yeah. And I, I'll attest to that, as you know, uh, we've been down there several times in the past. So I don't know, three to five years, it's something yeah. we tend to return to every 12 to 24 months. So hopefully we'll get down there at least in 2024 to, uh, to check things out. Hopefully though, people who tend to say, what, I went to the Alamo and it was just this church. Hopefully people won't say that anymore because you guys have a lot more going on than that. That'll help try to recreate not only as you say, not only the 1836 experience, but as you say, kind of the whole history of the, uh, of the mission itself. Yeah, I think this museum is going to change people's perception of what the Alamo is and, and what it stands for. It's it's it really is an exciting time. And I can't believe that during our lifetime we're going to be able to witness that. It's, yeah, it's awesome. All those projects should be done by 2028. Um, you know, hoping everything goes smoothly and there's not another COVID or something like that to mm-hmm. shut everything down. But um, yeah, we're excited. So come on down and visit us if you guys are listening and you're thinking about making a trip to San Antonio. Um, yeah, stop by. Well, it might be time for another Hessler Spoggy road trip to round up some of our Gettysburg <laughs> friends to come down and see it. So yeah, let's go. I'll, I'll let's talk go. to Phil about that. Hey, last but not least, I'll give a shout out to you guys have been podcasting, right? Every Is it Stories Bigger Than Texas? Do I have that title right? Yeah, that's right. We, the Alamo has its own podcasts on every major um, um, outlet that you can find a podcast on. I mean, everything from uh, Apple to uh, iTunes all the way through. Um to uh, YouTube. We have a YouTube channel where you can watch them. You can even watch them on our website if you don't want to download an app. So uh, we're doing a podcast and so far it's got a lot of traction. It's very exciting. Yeah. Yeah. You guys are doing great work with it. And so you got to say hi to all my friends there, Ernesto, Thomas, your lovely, your lovely wife, and uh, just everybody there who is, uh, who's been so good to us when we've, when we visited in the past and, and will be again in the future. So folks, if you're listening, If you're a Battle of Gettysburg podcast listener, you've been introduced to the Alamo. If we have Alamo people checking this out, come over then and see us at the Battle of Gettysburg podcast. So hopefully we'll do some good good cross-pollination here. Colby Lanham, I promised we would not go on much more than an hour and 15 minutes, and I think we're kind of more or less in that window. So can't thank you enough for taking time out of your busy schedule to come do this. And I could easily sit here and ask you questions for another three hours. So maybe we'll have to come back and, and get you back here for a part two or something. Well, thank you for having me. It's been exciting. Uh, I enjoyed the conversation. All right. Thanks, Colby. Good to see you. And uh, hopefully we'll uh, we'll catch up again soon. Thank you. All right.